Hello, BookTube. The other day on my channel, I went on a usual peroration about my love for electronic books, for ebooks, and for the experience of reading on my iPad, where this little slim slate of metal and glass, always at my fingertips, always ready with a library of thousands of books, uh, totally convenient. All you need is a power cord, uh, and how uh, it's easier to read just ergonomically than holding a book open. I can, I can do it all with one hand while I cuddle with the bean with the other hand. And how it's wonderful to uh, highlight passages and take notes. Uh, I can share those notes with myself. I can send them directly to a document I'm working on. No holding the book open and trying to figure out where I left something and whatnot. Also, that library can be searched easily. Thousands of books, but it can be searched easily. How many times on this channel and before I had this channel have I said how I wish I could simply stand in front of a room of books and call out for the book I'm looking for and have it answer? How many times have I wished that were true? And with an ebook library, it effectively is true. Uh, I went on that peroration. I, I praised ebooks and ebook reading. I praised the experience of reading on my iPad. And some of you may have seen uh, that in response to that, Mark Richardson of Richardson Reads. Uh, left a comment saying that it was horse pucky. <laughs> For those of you who may not be familiar with American idiom, idioms, a horse pucky is a term that Vermonters use for pretty much everything. <laughs> it's, they, they use it for everything that, that gets their goat, and their goat has gotten rather easily. His point being, he said, that I praise ebooks and ebook reading, but then I spend all the rest of my time buying printed books. And have thousands of them around me. Not as many as he does, but still lots and lots of them. Uh, and at first I viewed this as a failure on my part of simple balance. I have not figured out how to talk about ebooks effectively on this channel. I've seen other people do ebook hauls. Uh, Thomas at SFF180 has a, his a Monday mailbag. And he splits it between physical review copies and e arcs that he gets from from publicists uh sarah the bookish knitter does the same thing she will do she will do ebook hauls i'm not i haven't quite got around to doing that i get a lot of e of e galleys every week so i should clearly do that uh but nevertheless in response to mark's horse pucky taunt i thought i would uh retaliate in the best way possible which is to rush right out and buy more printed books <laughs> I think his general point was that I'm just in love with reading. Uh, although I meant my praise of ebooks, absolutely sincerely, I did. It's it's a little bit disproportionate to sh to constantly do physical book hauls on this channel because it does give a false impression of how much e-reading I do. I do a huge amount of it. Uh, but one way or another, <laughs> I went to the Brattle Bookshop uh, here in Boston. It's in downtown Boston. It's an old bookstore. It's... Uh, uh, used an antiquarium the antiquarium books are up on the third floor but the first two floors are just a jam-packed general interest used bookstore reasonable prices books usually in good condition on every subject imaginable uh and in addition to that there's a sale lot next door a whole lot the floor plan uh, the floor space of the entire other building that is just empty it's the only empty spot on the street where the prattle is and it's they fill it with bargain books thousands of them for one dollar three dollars and five dollars and you you they're not in any order other than price so you can you could spend two hours there browsing every book you easily could and it's one of the only bookish experiences that i still get around to i don't have a, a bright red truck like mark does i can't go on the road to use bookstores or charity shops of any kind so this is the brattle is one of the only examples that i have of a wonderful phenomenon uh, a phenomenon that you will also encounter at the book barn in Niantic, Connecticut, a place that I mentioned yesterday. Uh, and that is that the limit that you will reach uh, for how much stuff you're going to get in any one visit will be determined by weight rather than by price. You will The limit that you will reach will be how much you can effectively carry. And once you reach that limit, you'll be done. <laughs> and I did that today. It was a beautiful, beautiful spring day. Uh, not hot, not cold, bright sunlight. Uh, I haven't even had the heart to look at 
the weather data or long range charts because today has just been <sighs> weather to live in, weather to just live in. I, I went to the Brattle, I took uh, the bean on a long walk in the woods. Uh, and once we came down from the the high meadows in the woods, we we encountered lots of humans and lots of dogs. And I was reminded all over again what a wonderful dog this is. She is just so friendly to humans. I mean, outgoingly friendly to them. Loves to run up and jump up on them and say hi and smile up at them. And I haven't taught her not to do that because she weighs 10 pounds. She couldn't knock a child over. Uh, and to put it mildly, no one has ever objected. <laughs> She's so adorable that no one has ever objected to this little toy running over to you and, and greeting you with huge enthusiasm. But also, she's very good with dogs. She, she isn't effusive with them. She doesn't play with them. She doesn't really play at all. <laughs> uh, but she's not aggressive. Uh, she's, not, she's not huffy or territorial or anything like that. It was just absolutely wonderful. Just absolutely wonderful. We met... Uh, a woman who was walking who was walking down the path and uh, she was praising Frida and we started talking and I was talking about we got around to the dogs that she's had in her life and then we got around to the books that she's reading uh, and at one point Frida stopped walking and turned back and jumped up on her again and was sort of holding her leg and squirming with happiness and whatnot but uh, basically what Frida's doing in a situation like that is asking you to bend down so that she can lick your face uh, and I said, I said to the woman, yeah, she's just incredibly outgoing. She, she is just up for hanging out with anybody at any time. And the woman said, yeah, I wonder where she gets that. Everybody's got a comment. <laughs> but anyway, I got a huge number of books at the Brattle. I ordinarily don't do that. Ordinarily, when I, like I mentioned, ordinarily the, the guardrail is going to be how much you can carry. And for years and years... Years that are clearly not coming back. I had a cadre of muscular teenagers, undergraduates at, at, uh, a, bo at a college in Boston, uh, one of whom was a longtime friend of mine, known him literally since the day he was born, and the others were his friends. And uh, I ordered them around. They were my dog's body servants. And they, so when I went to the battle with them, they did the carrying, so I didn't have to worry how much, how much I pulled out. But... I, the pandemic has stopped all that, and by the time, if the things ever become such that we can just casually hang out again, they won't be teenagers anymore. They'll be young men. They'll probably be married with children and grandchildren. They'll all be craggy and everything like that. So I'm going to have to I'll find a new crop. <laughs> but in the meantime, I was limited by what I could carry. And yet, even so, I got a huge number of books. Huge this would definitely be one of those dumb, uh, big booktube, uh, I got so many books, book haul, where the thumbnail shows them alarmed by the fact that they got a hundred books, that they, they went went to their local chapters or Barnes & Noble and spent $575 on new books so they could do a massive haul of books that they're never going to read. They're never going to open them. It's not quite that size, but it is still huge. I, uh, I claim exemption from those kinds of videos because I think even those of you who don't particularly like me would have to admit that I read the books I get on this channel. Or maybe not. The ones of you who don't like me are probably just insane trolls. <laughs> but, uh, but I do. I do actively use the books that I get. So uh, I got a huge amount, and I'm only going to show you half. And it's not because I'm going to split it up into one video and another. I don't care how long my videos go. I'm not interesting at any length. <laughs> no, I'm going to show you only half because fully half of the books that I got are destined elsewhere. They're destined as gifts, donations, presents. I don't want to spoil the surprise. So this huge pile of stuff that I got is only half of what I got. Uh, and we're going to start with the only, one of the, it's the only mass market paperback and one of the only paperbacks that I got today. Used to be Once Upon a Time. When I went to the Brattle, I didn't even look at the $3 or $5 cards. I, will, I, I shopped only on the $1 cards, and even there, I never got any hardcovers. That was true even 20 years ago. Uh, but now? Now I don't really care. And mass market paperbacks that used to be the love of my life actually have shorter shrift because they tend to be flimsier, so they don't, they don't really take a lot of rereading, and they, they tend to be harder to use. I mean, you have to be more delicate with them. They're not as as rough and durable as a hardcover, and they're not as easy to read as a trade paperbacks. But I got one anyway because I'd never seen it before. 
Uh, it's this. It's the Viking portable Veblen. Uh, this is Thorsten Veblen, the, the uh, early 20th century uh, writer and academic and economist, who the guy who came up with the term conspicuous consumption, and who wrote a book called The Theory of the Leisure Class, where he turned his eye on the the massive wealth disparity and the huge plutocratic society that had gr that had grown up in the wake of um, the the massive automation and technologizing of the country at the end of the 19th century uh, and I didn't know that the Viking Portable Library I love the Viking Portable Library even in mass market paperback and I didn't know they did a Veblen one I had no idea I don't know why there's a bird in the back of that limousine. I can't quite figure that out. I'm sure it's an in-joke, but I can't quite figure it out. But one way or another, this has, uh, uh, I think, I don't think it has any any work of his complete, even Theory of the Leisure Class. No, okay, Theory of the Leisure Class is not complete. In Dispraise of, econ of, economists, of Economists is not complete. The Roots of Institutions is not complete. The Case for America is not complete. Uh, yeah, there are a whole bunch of shorter pieces and then uh, large chunks from the Theory of the Leisure class. And this is connected to a book that we've seen on this channel. I would have ignored this, even though I'd never seen it before. I wouldn't have got it, uh, even though I think almost everything here was a dollar. So these were dirt cheap. Uh, but I might have ignored this, except there was just recently a biography of Veblen. I forget the name of the author, but we saw it on this channel. We saw the advanced copy and the finished copy. And I really liked it. I really did. I really enjoyed it. I, it, I thought it was going to be all sorts of insider baseball and I wasn't going to get it, but no. I, not only did, did the author, was it Kanich? Not only did the author do a, huge, a, a really good job of explaining the concepts that Veblen made his whole career writing about, but also he, uh, he brought forward Veblen as a person in a lot of interesting ways. I, I found that just a fascinating book. And I noticed when I was reading that biography, as I often do when I'm reading biographies, I noticed when I was reading that biography how good the excerpts and quotes from Veblen's own writing really were. It had been, oh, I don't even know, 30 or 40 years since I read The Theory of the Leisure Class. I had no memory of him being such a good, engaging writer. So to get a volume of his writing, that's fantastic. That's absolutely fantastic. So that'll go uh, probably on the, the paperback bookcase in the little book room. Uh, then we do the other, we do the one of the other paperbacks. There are a couple more paperbacks, but this one is uh, connected also with something that we just saw at the Brattle. Uh, one of the, there, in fact, there are a lot of Brattle themes running through this, this hall. One of the themes of the Brattle is uh, that a person somewhere out there, the Brattle is always buying books, and somewhere out there a person will accumulate a certain set or theme of things, and then when they sell those, they sell them all. And the Brattle goes and they, with their van and they box everything up, and they bring it all over to the shop and they put it all down in the basement, and then gradually over time it comes up, those boxes come up and they are priced and they are put on shelves or out in the sale lot. and. Because that's true, if you find one item of a certain kind in the Brattle sale lot, chances are you will find another item like that. Uh, you'll find something akin to it. And the other day at the Brattle, I found a volume of Randall Jarrell's uh, poetry criticism. Randall Jarrell was a terrific poet. Uh, in Elizabeth Bishop, for instance, thought that he should have won, uh, I think it was was the Pulitzer Prize for poetry, that he should have won for poetry instead of her. Uh, but he was also uh, the, one of the best poetry critics ever to put pen to paper. And I found a volume of his on Auden and Kipling and Co. and whatnot. And this is, I found another volume of this, which I've had before. Uh, I've had almost all of Randall Giles' criticism before, but uh, it disappeared. Don't know how. <laughs> and I found the third book of criticism here little bit rough shape but I will I will reinforce the cover and it's not uh, highlighted or underlined which is the key with him because he's so good he's so quotable that it's hard to find an, a secondhand copy of his work that's that's clean so you can make your own marks in it which I intend to do I wish that uh, Library of America would swoop in here and do uh, either 
one volume of his that has uh, poetry in the age and a few other essays and then a bunch of poems. Or maybe two volumes. Two volumes is too much to ask for, but maybe two volumes. One of poetry and one of criticism. That would be great. <laughs> Absolutely great. But in the meantime, I'll definitely take this. Uh, I'll reinforce it and it will go... <laughs> Tragically, it will go on the bookcase over there that I specifically set up to handle books about books, books of reviews, books of essays, that sort of thing. I moved those books from a little bookcase in the other room because there was no room. So I, I gave them twice as much space. And that space is already almost full. Anyway, <laughs> and then we'll move on. The next one. <laughs> You will have seen on this channel, I have a fondness for great three-name Boston dinosaurs. From the time when Boston was the, the humming, brimming intellectual capital of the whole country. Uh, and one of the figures there is Charles Elliott Norton. You saw, I think you, you, some of you might remember that at the Brattle, I found a two-volume biography of Charles Elliott Norton, a life and letters type thing. And I found something today. Oh, my. <laughs> oh, my. Uh, can I find the... Uh, doesn't have a dust jacket. Uh, I found Charles Eliot Norton's translation of La Vida Nuova by Dante. Dante wrote the, uh, a slim and intricate and weirdly imbricated and weirdly uh, self-referential. It's almost impossible to describe the La Vida Nuova. He wrote it in 1294. And it's his other great work in addition to the Divine Comedy. And it's much smaller and very strange very just it's just dante at his most dante-esque <laughs> where he is just working and reweaving his prose in on itself over and over again in endless mobius strips that just it's beautiful to do and uh this is an english language translation that starts off with ludovina nuova and then has essays uh commentary by charles elliot norton so how wonderful <laughs> how wonderful is that that is just incredible the kind of find you're going to get at the brattle that you're not going to typically find anywhere else uh what else we got here we have a lot to go through this is going to be a long video <laughs> uh this next one is by somerset mom uh and this is ashenden his uh series of stories about a character called ashenden who was part of the british secret service and has uh, all sorts of piquant adventures with uh, weird desperate people and uh and whatnot and uh the the stories were based on was own on uh, uh mom's own experiences in the british secret service i found this old hardcover i had to reinforce it or it would never have made it back here uh this this old hardcover i don't know there's the author when he was young and trying to be dapper the this, this is highly autobiographical stuff the only change that that mom made uh, was uh, to make the main character Ashington interesting, <laughs> whereas he is not, was never interesting. <laughs> uh, let's see here. This is a 1941 reprint of this, so God knows. It, I, I forget how many editions this has. It's always, it's always been very popular. I've never had a copy, so I, I'm happy to grab it, absolutely, and reinforce it. And then this next one, oh my. <laughs> my. Like I told you, it was a great, it was a great Brattle book haul. And this next one also has an antecedent uh, in the little book room. Uh, this is by Robert E. Howard. This is The People of the Black Circle. With this uh, Frank Frazetta cover. And a long time ago, a couple of years ago at the Brattle, uh, or maybe it was in Vermont, I found another volume in this series. This is uh, Berkeley Putnam. This is These were authorized, I think, by Glenn Lord. Uh, I found another book in this series called uh, Red Nails, I think was that other one, that looks just like this, where it has the, the uh, Frazetta cover, no, no uh, chatter on the back cover, and one uh, frontispiece illustration there, and that's all. This has, uh, oh, this is edited by Carl Edward Wagner, and I believe this was authorized by Glenn Lord, uh, and it has uh, The Devil in Iron, the people of the black circle, a witch shall be born, and the jewels of Gwalor. Uh, and it's, uh, do we have another illustration? Yes, strike, I command you, strike. <laughs> and these are uh, amazing stories. These are Conan the Barbarian stories. The, there are a couple in here that are uh, 
just about as good as Conan gets. There's one conclusion, one of the stories in here has a conclusion that is quintessential Robert E. Howard Conan. Uh, and I'm happy to have it. Now Now that I know this exists, I want all... If Now I want to know how many volumes were done this way. In these hardcovers that look like this, I don't, I didn't, I didn't prep ahead of time, so I don't have red nails here to show you. But it's the same thing, it, and I want to know how many there are here. How many can I expect to find? Because I want them all. What I mean, I have other editions of Conan, of course, but uh, these are terrific. <laughs> so, so again, very happy to find it. Uh, then this next one is a bird book. Uh, it's called Iceland Summer: Adventures of a Bird Painter by George Sutton who was an American-born bird artist, very famous uh, 70 years ago. Uh, very famous bird artist, very famous ornithologist. He was, he was actually big in bird circles. Uh, and this is a, what he wrote many, many, many books. And this is one of his books illustrated by the author. There's, there's a, an adorable little thing. Uh, and those adorable little things are all throughout here. Uh, there are no color illustrations in this thing, as far as I remember. But this is... Uh, a memoir of a trip that he took to to Iceland. Naturally, it was on my mind because of Sag Along 2021. Uh, and it's full of bird lore, yes, because he's finding these things and sketching them. But it's also full of Iceland lore. If I remember this, I've never read the whole thing. But if I remember correctly, it's it's uh, very anecdotal in a very readable way. So it's a great combination of travel writing and bird writing. Uh, and again, these things were so cheap that I, I, there was no limit except how much I could carry. <laughs> on this next one is uh, Mark Amory's biography of Lord Berners, The Last Eccentric. Uh, this is a Pimlico paperback, and I want all the Pimlico paperbacks that exist in the world. <laughs> I want all of them. I have a discreet shelf full. I would like many, many more. I love them. Of all the UK trade paperbacks that exist, these are my favorites. So I would have got this anyway. Uh, but it's a biography of a, an interesting figure, um, an intimate of the Mitford sisters and, and a whole bunch of other society people, uh, a baron, an English baron, who I know, I know him from anecdotes that where he crops up in the books of other people. I don't think I've ever read a biography of him. So this is a weird example of where I know much, much more about the house where he was born <laughs> than I know about him. Appley House in, in uh, Shropshire is a place that I know very well. I know it very well. I have been there many times, and I had a wonderful visit there under the old owners a long time ago. Uh, got to explore all around, got to hear all of its history, and in addition to that, as you'll see later in this, in this Brattle Hall, I have a sweet spot for English country houses, and th that one is gorgeous beyond beyond it's just incredibly beautiful it's the, it's a gem of the english stately homes so i know more about this guy's birthplace than i do about him but i will rectify that because i'm always in the mood at the brattle i'm always in the mood for a biography of, of any kind uh i want more pimlico paperbacks i really do it just kills me that those of you in in london could just walk around the corner to the oxfam shop which i assume is open now or, or your nearest used bookstore, and see a whole bunch of Pimlico paperbacks, and you don't think anything of it. You don't think anything of your your bereft American cousin. <laughs> uh, so I grab them whenever I whenever I see them. They, I've never been let down by a Pimlico pa a trade paperback. Uh, this next one is uh, World War II history, uh, but it's disturbing. It's on the disturbing side of World War II history. I have had it in the past, but mostly as a very poorly made trade paperback. Uh, whereas this is a hardcover, and there are going to be plenty of people, and maybe even some of you, who will say, you know, why bother? But we have our own interests, right, as readers. And you can't always tell what those are going to be, and I've learned from experience not to resist them. Your interests are your interests. As I, I do plenty of reading that is so-called legitimate. I can do illegitimate reading if I want to. And I don't think it gets much more illegitimate than this author. This is David Irving. And this is his book, The War Path. Of 1933 to 1939. This is part two, I believe, of his big biography, basically a political and military biography of Adolf Hitler. The other one being Hitler's War. And again, like I mentioned, I'm wondering if, if, if the, did the person who get rid of this also have Hitler's War, and will that show up? Because I used to have Hitler's War, and I don't anymore. 
I don't at the moment have any David Irving here in printed book form. I have some ebooks. Uh, but what can I say about David Irving that I haven't said already? Those of you who don't know who he is, he uh, was uh, born to an uh, uh, officer in the British Navy, an officer in the British Navy who ran convoy ships during World War II, so basically he had the same upbringing as Christopher Hitchens. Uh, same kind of skill with uh, gripping writing. He's he's a very readable writer. But he went into history. Went into writing histories. Uh, and some of his early books were critically praised. This one, I think, was one of the last ones to just be just be received by the critical brethren and critic and historical critics as maybe a little odd on the fringes, but but obviously a serious work. Uh, and that was gradually changing. Because very slowly, David Irving was falling under the spell of Adolf Hitler, even though Hitler was dead long before he wrote a single word of history. Long before that, he was... Hitler may have been dead, but he had the power to mesmerize still certain types of personalities, and it worked on David Irving. He His work got less and less trustworthy, less and less good, and started to show fissures and cracks in earlier works like for instance his breakout book was on the, the firebombing of dresden and one of the reasons why it was a breakout book is because he put the original estimates of the dead due to the allied firebombing of dresden at a hugely inflated number based on faulty on the fall on faulty reading of of untrustworthy sources and refused to back down for a long time as far as i know david Irving is still alive and as far as i know he has backed down from a lot of his fraudulent claims uh, but it doesn't matter none of it matters because he drifted closer and closer to what we would now call holocaust denial he started out asking legitimate historical questions including one that drove historians insane he started out by saying well I, I have read Hitler's table talk, and I admit I have a fondness for this character in history. I think that history may have been rougher with him than he deserves. Uh, no doubt, he started out by saying, no doubt he was a monster, no doubt he was a dictator, no doubt he was uh, an authoritarian. But, for instance, the fact that the historical establishment blames him for the Holocaust, well, show me the proof of that. Show me a single document that directly connects Hitler to a knowledge of what was going on in the death camps at Treblinka or whatever. Show me that he knew that. Don't just tell me that he did. Don't infer it. Prove it to me. Because I know the German documents as well as anyone or better, and I've never found any direct link like that. And that's not how history is supposed to happen. And at first, some historians responded to that. At first, some of them said, okay, well, that's an awkward question, but a valuable one. We do need to ask questions like that. But he drifted further and further away from that to believing that it, the Holocaust never happened, that it was all um, a big hoax, that it's been drastically misunderstood. And he started, once you take that step, it's a very small move to start channeling anti-Semitism, to, to start embracing anti-Semitism, to be infected by one of mankind's earliest viruses, this this deadly virus of anti-Semitism, that once it infects you, it's almost impossible to get it out of your system. It, it, it starts to afflict everything you do. And he was in the full grip of that. He'd already been barred from, I forget how many countries, when Deborah Lipstadt, an, an American scholar, referred to him as a Holocaust denier, and he sued her. Said that he wasn't one. That, that And the trial took place in England, it was a big circus event, and the verdict came down against him in the most damning way possible. That not only was he a Holocaust denier, but he was also a falsifier of historical records and a racist. And he he blustered and put on a brave face, I don't know how you could do anything else, and just kept on going. But obviously, once a British court has found like that, your professional reputation is over you were never going to get another mainstream public book anymore. He's, he's taken to self-publishing his books and he's kept writing. Uh, and he's, he's got to be very old by now. I think he was born in the early 1940s or the late 1930s. So he would be, he would be old by now. Uh, and I find him fascinating. I honestly do. I find him fascinating. I want to, to understand what happened to David Irving. Uh, 
I don't think I don't think that any of the easy answers that I've heard really apply and and I don't have any of his books and I have a feeling that if he's still alive I have a feeling that he won't be alive for long and I know that I'm going to want to reappraise him I'm going to want to look at his works I've read pretty much everything that he's written a few minor things that I have never been able to track down but for instance he has been writing in the last 10 years major big brick biographies of Goering, Himmler, the, of major Nazi operatives. And there's a huge amount of work that goes into those things. I don't know what to make of them. I don't know what to make of them. And I also don't 100% like the way the historical establishment has reacted to him almost from the start. I'm not saying that anything that he thought or has said was justified, but when he talks about, he has scathing comments for that historical establishment. And not all of those comments strike me as completely insane. So, <laughs> so I don't. I he's a, he's a fascinating figure for me. I find him fascinating. Uh, so I got I got the Warpath. I used to have it as a trade paperback. I got it as a hardcover, and I will probably reread sections of it before I put it on the shelf. Uh, then this next one, this next book is a perfect example of another theme at the Brattle, which is that the Brattle will provide. Uh, I have mentioned that many, many times that something will happen in your reading or your whatever, and you will suddenly realize, oh, wait, I want book X, Y, or Z, and you don't have it. The Brattle will provide it. Sooner or later, if you go often enough, the Brattle will provide it. And I had an example of that happen the other day with a book that I showed you. I don't know if I still have it here. It, it's by Lindell Roper, and it's called Living I Was Your Plague, a collection of sort of essays and reflections on the cultural ramifications of Martin Luther as a kind of companion volume to Lyndall Roper's big, very good biography of Martin Luther. And I read that biography. I loved it. I think I, I reviewed it, I believe, for... Uh, I don't know who I reviewed it for. I might have reviewed it just for Open Letters. Uh, and I thought, okay, well, I have, I have a very pronounced sweet spot for Roland Bayton's Here I Stand his biography of Martin Luther, but I thought this is, it's worth having two. If I can have seven biographies of Lord Byron, I can have two of Martin Luther. Uh, so I put it on the shelf, and then when I got Living I Was Your Plague, I thought, oh, that was so good. Surely I should revisit parts of Lyndall Roper's biography of Martin Luther, and I went to the shelf, and it was not there. <laughs> it was not there, because I sent it probably to one of you. And I saw, I, I, I just, literally, the melodramatic, the hand just poised in front of the bookcase. And I thought, oh. <laughs> and then I thought, no, the Brattle will provide. Sooner or later, I will see it. And I did. That is Lyndall Roper's biography of Martin Luther. It's in, it's in worse shape than mine was, but I'll, I'll definitely take it. Absolutely. And this one, hopefully, I won't get rid of. <laughs> I don't know where or why I would have done that. But I've got to learn not to do that. Uh, and then... Uh, this next one is the same thing. The Brattle will provide, although in this case, not even the Brattle will provide in the full sense of the term where I was looking for something. Instead, this was something that just came up in bookish conversation, and I hadn't even got around to formulating that I actually wanted a copy, and then it, there it was for a dollar, so I, I grabbed it. And that's this, The Greater Journey by David McCullough. We just talked about this on my, uh, my 11K Q&A when I, I, I mentioned that this was seemed like an unlikely subject and was a really good book uh and this is that here it is <laughs> now i know sooner mentioned it then here it is this is mccullough's uh account of uh the enthralling and until now untold story of adventurous american artists writers doctors politicians architects and others of high aspiration who set off for paris in the years between 1830 and 1900 uh, wouldn't have thought that it was possible for it to be as good a book as it was. I haven't read it since it came out. When did this come out? Uh, 10 years ago? Hmm, when did you? 2011, yeah, 10 years ago. So, uh, and there it was. <laughs> you know, I just, I no sooner mentioned it than it showed up at the Brattle. Uh, then this next one is another theme of the Brattle, and that is that it can allow you, the Brattle can allow you to take second chances on things. Things will crop up that you, you read, maybe, reviewed in my case, dismissed, and then maybe it's been nagging at your mind. Maybe you've been thinking about it, and sooner or later you get a second chance at it. And this is a minor version of that. I admit it, the books don't get much more minor than this. But I ended up liking it, and I've been thinking about it. So I could stand with a reread. This is, as the great title, Swipe Right for Murder 
<laughs> it's by Derek Millman. It's part of the James Patterson line. It's about a, a teenage boy who who uh, finds himself alone in New York in a in bed with a dead body, <laughs> and then the the plot just ricochets on from there it's totally ridiculous but i found it in, enjoyable in a brainless kind of way and i think i reviewed it if i remember correctly i will leave a link to my review but then i got rid of it i thought you know this is nothing it's fluff i'm not, there's no reason for me to keep this but it stuck with me i kept thinking about it especially the ending like the last 100 pages so for a dollar i will definitely try it again uh, you, you don't want to turn down an offer like that when the brattle up makes one to you uh then this next one uh was a find i don't didn't know that this existed in hardcover at all this is i think back to 1980 when all the world made sense this is a science fiction novel called wind haven by george rr R. martin and lisa tuttle uh and it, it has the the same dorky cover art that was on the mass market paperback i read this as a mass market paperback a timescape paperback i believe uh, and it had this dumb dorky, this dumb dorky artwork. And I honestly, it never even crossed my mind when I read that mass market. And then years and years later, I found another mass market copy. I had lost my original one. I reread it in mass market, but it had never crossed my mind that it was ever a hardcover. And here it is. And I was, I was stunned when I saw it. I, I, for a minute, I didn't know what I was looking at, but this, this is the novel Windhaven in a hardcover. In perfect condition, the day like the day it was made. This is his, it started out life as a short story that I think won an award uh, for the, like the the waves of Windhaven or the storms of Windhaven or something like that. Uh, and then uh, Lisa Tuttle and George R. R. Martin made this into a novel, uh, and it's it's a generational novel. It's it takes place over the lifetime of the main character, and uh, it's a it's a water world full of sharp windswept archipelagos that have no telecommunications. Of course, this thing was written before any such thing as Wi-Fi or anything like that. So the book is written in blindness of those things. There's a, there's a colonizing ship that is cannibalized by its humans to make, among other things, uh, these big elaborate glider wings. The, the planet Windhaven has, a, if I, I'm, I'm winging it from my second reading 30 years ago, uh, but the planet has a, a lower specific gravity and dense atmosphere and strong winds. So it's possible to use these flying apparatuses to go from archipelago to archipelago, transmitting messages, treaties, that sort of thing. And the, a guild builds up around these flyers. And it, the, it's an, an amazing, fun, meaty book, a real good look at the main character and a whole bunch of other secondary characters. And I haven't read it since I read that second mass market. And now I don't have to worry about the mass market paperback falling apart as soon as I'm done reading it. I have it in hardcover now. Who knew there was a hardcover of Windhaven? Maybe Mark Richardson did, but I certainly didn't know. So that was that was great to find that. Uh, then this next one is uh, uh, one of the things that you find at the Brattle like that uh, that Vita Nuova, one of the things that you find at the Brattle that you're unlikely to find in a normally used bookstore, because this thing is 120 years old. This is from uh, 1898. This is a, a book called, uh, let me see if I can get you the title page. Uh, oh, okay. All right. Well, aren't you pretty? Uh, this The book is actually called The Bullfinch Front. <laughs> but that is that is not that no one ever bothered to call it that because this was never a real book this was never made for uh retail sale in bookstores this was it, it's a collection of of speeches and and prayers and addresses for the centennial of of the bullfinch state house uh the massachusetts state house this was done in 1898 to celebrate the centennial of the state house that was finished in 1798 uh and it, it's it's uh, an, a, a collection of, there's nothing black and white for that. It's a collection of various, of the various essays and addresses that were done during the event that celebrated the centennial. So I'm never going to see this in the wild again. Never in a million years am I going to see this in the wild again. So I grabbed it because these speeches and uh, addresses won't be anywhere else right they won't be they won't be recorded anywhere else so uh so i grabbed it the the uh 
the Boston State House, if you come to Boston and visit me, I will take you to see it. I know every inch of the State House, every single inch of it. Uh, I've been in it in all weathers, in all times of life. I know the basements and the attics. And the, found, the foundation stone was laid by Samuel Adams, and the building was renovated in 100 years later. And uh, this is all the dignitaries and poobahs that came out to talk about that. The book even starts with the, uh, the prayer that the chaplain of the state house wrote just for the occasion. And that's the sort of thing that I'm never going to see anywhere else. And of course it interests me. I know a lot of the names in here backwards and forwards. Uh, and I've taken people on, on little tours of the state house. I remember one, one time uh, a friend was coming from out of town to visit and I had errands to run. And one of my errands was my usual, at the time, my usual satchel full of packages that had to go out to be mailed. And I met my friend uh, at uh, the doorway to the Boston Athenaeum, and which is right across the street from the State House. And the State House is right across the street from the Shaw Memorial, the, the Robert Gould Shaw Memorial by August St. Gaudens, that I love to show people anyway. And... Uh, I told my friend, well, you know, we have a lot of time. We have a lot of things to do. One of the errands that I have to do is uh, to mail these packages. And my friend said, oh, well, from what I gather, the post office is across town. Are you? Are we going to trek all the way over there just to mail these things? And I said, no, no, <laughs> no, no, no. There's a working post office in the state house. And he said, no, there isn't. And I said, yes, there is. <laughs> yes, there is. It's a little bit, and by a little bit, I mean a lot hard to find. <laughs> but I know where it is. Let's go there. And he said, I don't know where you're leading me. After a while, we were going through down little half flights of stairs and down corridors. And I was saying hi to people because I knew a lot of people that I was passed all the time. Uh, after a while, he said, I don't know where you're leading me. And eventually, I, we, I led him to a tiny working post office. Now, I don't know if the pandemic has closed the state, the state house post office. I have no idea. It was idiosyncratic at the time anyway. <laughs> the, the, the woman who ran it had no help and ran her own hours. If she felt like leaving for two hours, there'd just be a curt sign in the window and you were out of luck. But I used to use it a lot, uh, that post office, especially when I was writing... Uh, when I was working on stuff at the Athenaeum right across the street. So, but anyway, uh, I couldn't pass this up, right? Obviously, I couldn't pass this up. I know everything about Thomas Bullfinch. I know everything about Samuel Adams. I know everything about the State House. And, and this is not, this was not a commercially for sale book. So it's, it's not like there are going to be, you know, lots of copies out there. So I grabbed it. And then the final thing for this hideously long Brattle book haul, and keep in mind, this is half of what I got. <laughs> the final thing is just a, a treat for me. I just couldn't believe it when I saw it. This is by John Harris, and it is The Architect and the British Country House, 1620 to 1920. Uh, it's a paperback, hugely illustrated paperback. It has floor plans, sketches, dialogues, paintings, photographs, everything for, Brit for the British Country House. Actually, I wonder if... Uh, I wonder if uh, Lord Berner's birthplace is in here. No, apparently it's not. Oh, well, that stinks. Well, anyway, lots of other things are in here. <laughs> Oakham House is in here, for instance, that I know so well. But I know all these houses really well. I've been in, in all of them and and stayed in a lot of them to, to poke around. And I have lots of other books on English country houses, but I never even knew that a thing like this existed. How wonderful. <laughs> so this is going to be a lot of, uh, of daydreaming that's going to go into this. You have architectural plans in here and, and floor plans. So you know where the bedrooms are and the bathrooms were. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. And that's it. That is the brattle for today. <laughs> I don't think a Steve Pyramid is possible, but we'll give it a try. So the English Country House. And then we have the Bullfinch Front which is only the title on the spine. The book doesn't know that it's called that. We have Martin Luther by Linda Roper, this time going on the shelf in biography and hopefully not coming off it. We have The Warpath by the infamous David Irving. Uh, we have Windhaven by George R.R. R. Martin back when he could be edited. Uh, and Lisa Tuttle, who's never needed editing. <laughs> we have Swipe Right for Murder. <laughs> uh, a sort of a gay... Uh, James Patterson thriller type thing. We have The Greater Journey by David McCullough. Uh, that I just mentioned the other day on this channel. 
we have Lord Berners, The Last Eccentric, uh, a Pimlico trade paperback. If you're in the UK and you see Pimlico trade paperbacks, feel free to email me. <laughs> we have Iceland Summer. A bird artist goes to Iceland to see what he can see. We have The People of the Black Circle by Robert E. Howard. Another of these hardcover Robert E. Howard with Frazetta covers. We have Ashenden uh, by Somerset Mom in a hardcover, an old hardcover. We have uh, Charles Elliot Norton's translation of uh, Dante's La Vida Nuova. We have the third book of criticism by Randall Jarrow from my overcrowded criticism bookcase. And finally, the portable Veblen. A, a Viking Portable Library Edition that I didn't even know existed. <laughs> so, fantastic. A fantastic Brattle Hall. And if I'd had a car right around the corner or a couple of muscular teenagers, who knows if I wouldn't have even more. <laughs> but no. <laughs> uh, so that's it for now. Good Lord. 45 minutes is long enough. I'm going to wrap this up. <laughs> but I'll be back. Thank you, Book 2.